My name is Mark Stuffchuck, and uh, that's my wife Juanita in the purple. And we're, we're at Crosswaves Church. And if you ever wonder where Crosswaves Church is, it's at home. Because we don't have a church. Everything we do is through podcasts. And the message is delivered at a variety of groups that meet at home throughout the week. So, and basically my responsibility is being a mentor to the group leaders. And my wife and I responsibility is being mission leaders to that uh, church. So we just came back from Johannesburg, South Africa. And if all things work out well in November, I will be heading over to Kenya and reaching out to those people as well. Amen. So that is our responsibilities and just to share the gospel with, with, with others. So let's go to prayer. Father, I give you thanks and praise for today. I thank you for the opportunity that we can come and have fellowship with Page Avenue Baptist Church. It's my hope that my words will be your words, my thoughts will be your thoughts. That we have open hearts to hear what you have in store for us through your word. That you reach out to us, you bless us, you walk with us, you guide us, you protect us. And let us realize that apart from you, we are truly nothing. In Jesus' precious name, to our Father. Amen. Amen. I wanted to open up with Sunday school, because that's what Sunday school is all about. On page 26, there was something that caught my attention. Have you ever decided, should I or shouldn't I? Should I or shouldn't I? And then you finally say, I'm going to do this. This is what God's called me to do. And eventually, when you get to that point, that somebody confirms it for you, well, as I was preparing my message, and my message is about relationships, I said, Lord, is this what you really want until I came to Sunday school? And at Sunday school, it gave me the confirmation. There's two lines I want to read in here. On page 26, it says, We should guard against only listening to ourselves or to other people. Here are some dangers in doing so. And it goes on and tells you, tells you the dangers. Then it also says, we should never listen to these voices, even our own, more than we should listen to God. Amen. Amen. And that's what we're going to talk about is relationships. And we have a variety of relationships. We have a relationship with God. We have a relationship with Jesus. He died for us. We have a relationship with the Spirit that lives within us. We also, some of us know, have a relationship with the devil and doing things that we should not be doing. We have a relationship with our wives. Or we have a relationship with... <laughs> that's good. <laughs> no, that's all right. I like humor. <laughs> or our husbands. We have relationships with our children, co-workers, etc., etc., and the relationship I'm really going to talk about is going to be in Genesis chapter 3. We're going to go to the very beginning. And we'll be in Genesis chapter 3, the first seven verses, 1 through 7. Relationships about husbands and wives. <laughs> And it reads, Now the serpent was more craftier than any beast of the field which the Lord God has made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said, You shall not eat from any tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat from it or touch it, or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, You surely will not die, for God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Then the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise. She took from its fruit and ate. And she gave also to her husband with her and ate. And he ate. Well, that's a pretty simple story. Satan comes. He talks to Eve. Eve goes ahead, falls into the trap, eats the fruit, 
and we're all doomed. Okay, that's the end of my message. We ought to go home now. <laughs> Actually, if you peek underneath the hood, as you like peek underneath the hood of a car, and you, hopefully there's an engine there, if you peek underneath the hood, there's a lot of information in these seven simple scriptures that I'm going to talk about. Okay? Let's start with the first one, communication. Communication between a husband and wife should be hopefully on the same page. But when you read this scripture, notice what Eve said. Eve said, we should not eat from the tree or touch it. That's not really true. That's not what was said. And you say, what? Did I miss something here? Let's go to Genesis chapter 2. Go to Genesis chapter 2 for me. How did Eve know not to eat from the tree or the knowledge of good and evil? If you go to Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 to 17, it says, Then the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely. But from the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. Okay, that's what it said, period, end of sentence. Now notice that's at the beginning, verses 15 to 17, and he's talking to the man. Let's move on a little farther down that chapter in verses 21 and 22. Lo and behold, so the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. Then he took one of the ribs and closed up the flesh and at the place. The Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. God spoke to Adam. Don't eat from the tree. Then he created the woman. Explain to me how in verse 3 when she was talking to Satan, when Eve was talking to Satan, that she said, we should not eat from it or touch it. Where'd she get that thought from? I mean, come on, let's think about it. She wasn't there when God was talking to Adam. She came afterwards. But then all of a sudden, in verse 3, she's talking to Satan, and she said, we should not eat it, or touch it. Now think this picture out. Men work in, I work in sandboxes. Now my wife, she doesn't work in sandboxes. She's kind of like all over the place. But men work in sandboxes. Now picture this. Here's my sandbox, and here's my sandbox, and here's my sandbox. And then all of a sudden, my wife comes along, and she starts throwing dirt in each sandbox all over the place. Because that's the way sometimes we communicate. I'll say one thing and she'll think another. No, 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 no. What are you doing? Don't be messing around with the sandbox. The sand stays here. We're talking about this problem, this issue. Do not go over in that sandbox. But that's not the way my work, wife works. She culminates everything together. And you got these, all these wiggly worms in one ball. And, and it's like, okay, we need to separate this out and talk about each one. Men and women. It's kind of like how we communicate with each other. Where did she, she get that thought? Not to touch it or you will die. Adam probably said, hello, don't eat it, don't touch it, don't even look at it. Stay away from it. You know, that's communication between a husband and wife. Exactly. I, I'll give you a, a, a small example. Be careful. Okay. <laughs> when I was dating my wife, we were at Walmart. And she went ahead and said one word. She goes, why don't you touch me? And I kind of looked at her like, no, I'm not touching you. What's wrong with you? And all of a sudden, I felt this dark cloud hovering over our relationship. So I finally asked, I said, what is your definition of touch? And she said, 
you know, hold my hand, maybe put your arm around me. And then she finally asked, well, what's your definition of touch? And I just kind of stepped back and looked at her. <laughs> and uh, she got all embarrassed. She goes, well, that's not what I meant. But it's how we perceive things. And Adam probably said to Eve, don't touch it, don't look at it, don't eat, we're going to die. But we found out that didn't happen in that case. Communication. Let's think about this. God measures our communication with Him on how we communicate with each other. I mean, let's think about it. We can't see God, but we can see each other. We can see each other, we can touch each other, we can see your facial expressions. There's a lot of communication. And if we can't communicate with each other, how in the world are we going to communicate with God? I mean, yes, we can go in our own quiet place and talk to the Lord. And yes, we can meditate on His Word and everything. But really, He wants to hear us. But He wants us to communicate with each other. And if that's an issue, how are we going to communicate with Him? How are we going to make sure we know what He's really trying to tell us? What we need to do in our lives if we can't communicate with each other and get on the same page. Pray continually. That's one of our communications with Him. Continue to keep on praying. When we walk through life, every second, every minute, every hour of every day, do you subconsciously always meditate on the Lord and say, Lord, am I doing the right thing? Are you checking yourself? Do you got a plumb line? Am I saying the right thing? Am I doing the right thing? Am I doing what you want? Subconsciously, is he walking alongside you? Or did you leave him behind? You know, you're over here and he's over there and he says, Hello, I'm over here. You know, are, are you walking with him? Are you praying continually to have a relationship with each other? Because we need that. For me to love my wife and to have a relationship with her, I need to have Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I need to have Jesus Christ in the center of my life so her and I can get on the same page. Because apart from Him, I am truly nothing. Let's move on. Now, here's the important point. The serpent reasoned and Eve pondered. And we do this in our lives. We reason with each other. And we ponder about it. It goes on in verse in, in, in Genesis where I was. It says, for surely, this is uh, what the woman is saying. No, I'm sorry. God has said, you shall not, uh, I'm sorry. The serpent said to the woman, you will not die. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. He's reasoning with her. He says, look at the positives here. You'll get to know good and evil. You'll get to be like God. And Eve starts to ponder about it. Hmm. When the woman saw the tree, yeah, it looks pretty good. It was a delight to her eyes. And the tree was desirable to make one wise. And she took from it. And she ate. And then she gave it to her husband. Who was sitting like maybe right next to her. Maybe not. He didn't really double check, but he ate it too. But the point is, is the communication that was going on here. He reasoned. And she pondered. Isn't that what we do in life? How many of you made bad decisions off of reasoning with someone else? Come on. We've made bad decisions. How many of you ponder about it? Come on, guys. How many of you wanted to really want that John Deere tractor? Yeah, look at, look at the hand. Oh, we got a lady back there that wants the John Deere tractor. I bet you could come up with a probably a good 20, 25, 30 reasons why I need to have that tractor. Even though I may go broke, I need that $1,800 tractor because it's going to help me get through the day to cut that lawn. You know how much time that will save me? 
You could reason yourself into it, couldn't you? Pondering about it, reason yourself, talk to your neighbor about it, build some alliances. Yeah, I think you need to buy that too. Sure, I'm not going to help you with a penny, but you need to buy it. We got. We live in a trailer, my wife and I. We just moved in the trailer, as she mentioned. And we have this grass that I need to cut now because I didn't have to. Uh, we sold our mortgage, and the mortgage was really a condo. So I never had to cut grass for the last nine years. So here I am. I need a lawnmower. So I'm at Lowe's, and I see these orange, large tractors, $1,800. Honey, I think I need one of those. You do not need an 18 dollars tractor to cut the grass. All you need is a little push, and that'll be taken care of. So uh, through our garage sale, which somebody just uh, mentioned, my wife hates garage sales. It so happens my friend came by, and he we had this five CD player, and I said, well, I'll sell it to you for 20 bucks. And lo and behold, I found out he had extra lawnmowers. And I said, well, I need a lawnmower to cut my grass. We were talking, and he says, I'll sell it to you for 20 bucks. I said, it's a deal. <laughs> so I put that lawnmower to work as of yesterday. The serpent reasoned, and he pondered. Is there anything wrong with reasoning? Answer? No. No, I see his head shaking. No, there isn't nothing wrong with reasoning. Isaiah 118. You don't have to turn there. I'm just going to bring it out. Isaiah 118. The Lord says, Come now, let's reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they should be like wool. But what did he say? Let us reason together. There's nothing wrong with reasoning. It all depends who you're reasoning with. Unfortunately, Eve was reasoning with Satan. But the Lord says to his people, Come, let us reason together. Now, don't be misled in this. Because the Lord also says in 1 Corinthians 15.33, Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. You eventually start hanging around the wrong people, Amen. you're going to start changing like them. Amen. Amen. You're going to be saying things that you shouldn't be saying. You're going to be doing things that you shouldn't be doing. And your money's going to be going somewhere it shouldn't be going. Amen. Amen. So make it a choice. If you're going to reason, go reason with the Lord. Amen. I mean, the perfect Lord who created you from the time or knitted you together in your mom's belly. He knows every hair on your head. He knows what's best for you. You may not like hear what he has to say, but trust me, it'll go well with you. You just need to take that step forward. Follow him. Is there anything wrong with pondering? Ladies, I ask you because I'm going to bring out Mary. When Mary went ahead and had her baby Jesus and her cousin came by, and, and uh, which was John the Baptist, and he jumped in the, the womb, what did Mary do? It says in Luke 2.19, But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. Amen. Lord, what do you have in store? I am so excited. I am pondering about what you have in store for us. But the other side of it, Proverbs 4.23, Be careful what you think, because your thoughts will run your life. Be careful what you think, because your thoughts will run your life. Think about your life and where you are and what he has in store for you. You should be excited. We may go through tri trials and tribulations, but ponder about the Lord. God, that's okay. And you can even say, God, I don't like this. Just many times I said, Lord, I don't like what you're putting me through right now. This is this is horse manure. I'll just put it out there. I really don't like it. But you know what? I know there's a reason why I'm going through it. And you're trying to teach me. So I'm just going to go through it, holding as tight as I can onto you. And you're just going to walk me through this. And when it comes out, it's going to be good to go. And you know what? There's times I have failed. 
There's times I have failed. And you know what I've done? I said, Lord, I have failed in this area. I know I failed miserably. But guess what? Do not give up on me. Do not give up on me. Pick me back up. Dust the dust off me and try me again in this area. Because I want to shine for you. I want to shine for you. I want to be so spot shineless for you. I want you to knock off this, this trial that I failed and test me again in it. Because I want to get it right. And when I get it right, I know you're going to go ahead and be testing me in other areas. So, reasoning and pondering. Now, Satan knows his future. Let's face it. Misery loves company. Misery loves company. Notice what he was doing. He was projecting his desires upon Eve. He knew that he was where he was going, but he wanted the human race to go there as well with him. He started to go ahead and reason and project his desires. You surely will not die, for God knows that in the day you will eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil, and there's your first lie. There is your first lie. Satan lied right there. He reasoned her into something that was a true lie. He fell for it. How many of times have you fell for something that was a lie? And who was paying the consequences? Yeah. Not Satan. You were. Man. You were paying the consequences. You were paying for the hurt and the pain. So there's your first lie. And he was dragging the, dragging the human race because he knew he had to get her to reason with him. He was projecting his desires out onto her. Misery loves company. Amen. If somebody's feeling bad and they want allegiance, they're going to drag you into it. Amen. They're going to try to reason you into this. Amen. You ever see, I, I, uh, my wife and I have seven children. And sometimes they want allegiance because they think they're right. So what they do is they get the other brothers and sisters to line up with them to make sure... I've got the power. I've got the, even though they're wrong, I think this is the way it should be. No, that's not the way it works. <laughs> Misery loves company. Yes, sir. Let's align with each other. Yeah. My child, if sinners entice you, turn back mm -hmm. on them. Mm -hmm. Turn your back on them. This is in Proverbs 1 and 10 or 14. Proverbs 10 says once again, My child, if sinners entice you, turn your back on them. Flee. And then verse 14, it says, Do not throw in your lot with them and share in their loot, because you will only drown with them. Where Jesus is, Satan can't be. And where Satan is, Jesus is turning its back on you if you're truly a Christian. Amen. He has to turn his back. He can't look at sin. Amen. But if you have Jesus Christ in your life and say, I've got the power to say no. I've got the power, really, when you really think about it in James, James says when you give in to your selfish desires, actually when you think about it, you're the only one that has to control to destroy your life. I've heard it in Sunday school there's many times that I find myself causing my own problems. You have the control to say no. No, say not today. Not on my watch. I'm doing it God's way. Jesus Christ is my Savior. He is my commander and officer. I am going to do what He wants and not what you want. Leave the door. There it is. Don't let it hit you on the way out. Amen. But you ain't getting into my heart. The door is locked solid. And the one who lives in there who's cleaning it is Jesus Christ. That's where we need to be. Amen. Reason with them, ponder with them, turn your back on the evil one. So misery loves company. So think about all the things that we've been through. The reasoning, the pondering, the misery, the projection of sin. And then last of all, the lack of faith. What did Eve do? She turned her eyes off of God and she put them 
on herself. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and it was a delight to her eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from the fruit and ate. Who was she considering? She was considering herself. She lost her faith. She lost her focus. Faith is looking at it from God's eyes. Not your eyes, because they won't be open. Looking at it from God's point of view, and not from your point of view. That's what faith is. Faith is stepping out. Faith is saying, I am going, Lord, because I am going for the glory of God. And you're going to guide me and lead me along. Don't look at it from your eyes, as Eve did. Peter, we had this conversation this morning in Sunday school. Peter, what did he do? He jumped out of the boat. Jesus said, come, you can walk on water. Really? I can do that. He jumped right out. Had no problem. He was doing it. He took that first step. And he kept his eyes on Jesus, and he was doing well, To all of a sudden, the fear of the wind and the waves. And what did he do? He took his eyes off of Jesus, and he focused on them. He lost his faith. He was doing well. And once he turned his eyes off of him, what did he do? He started to drown. Jesus picked him right back up. You of ye of little faith. You of little faith. Satan goes, Your eyes will be open. No, they won't. Your eyes will be open. No. They won't be opened. Yeah, you'll be open into doom. That's what he tried to do. He projected his ideas to get her to open her eyes to what he wanted. Did anybody project their bad ideas upon you and you fell into that trap? Those smooth talking salespeople? You need that car. You gotta have that car. It may take you broke, but I think we can fit it in your budget. It might be eighteen to twenty thousand. No, I don't think so. I'll give you a perfect example. I know one man mentioned about a, a car accident. I had a blue Cavalier. And in this blue Cavalier, my wife and I had to sell it to buy a home, but we didn't have no down deposit. So the blue Cavalier got into an accident. It was drivable, but the people, the insurance said, we need to total it because this costs way too much damage. But I said, it can drive. But that's okay. We're going to total it and give you a check for $2,700. Hello. (laughs) So I had a car that was banged up that I could still drive to point A to point B. Nothing wrong with the tires. Nothing wrong with the engine. I just had a banged up car. Somebody had to smash down the hood. That's fine. But I had a $2,700 check. Guess where that went? That went for our down deposit for our house. Same car. Christmas Eve. We're driving along. We had a problem with one of our appliances. I think it was the dryer. The dryer went out. Cost about $500. Here it is, Christmas Eve, driving to Walmart. And I'm at this stop sign. And I'm watching this truck barreling down behind me. It's like, that thing ain't going to stop. I mean, she's moving. And she must have hit a patch of ice. That thing ain't going to stop. I'm screaming. My wife's looking at me like, what are you, nuts? I said, that thing ain't going to stop. Bam, they hit us. No one was hurt. But because it was on PLPD, or something like that, PLD, did I say that right? Yeah. Okay. We got a check for $500. What plate paid for the appliance? There you go, honey. Gave it to my wife. She went ahead and bought a dryer. We're good to go. And I still have a car to drive. I had to have someone bang out the hood again, but that's okay. I mean, the car might have not looked in great shape. But you know what? It's God, it's God's car. That's right. It's not my car. Amen. He gave it to me. Amen. And he blessed me through it. And we kept that car for a few other years. We have been blessed. Amen. But everything belongs to him. Amen. He gives it. He takes it. Amen. You have to determine what you're going to do with it. Are you going to open up your home? Are you going to use your car? Maybe there's a bystander that needs somehow 
Even with our finances, He's watching you. He's watching you. Whether you're going to do it your way, or come up with a whole bunch of reasons of why not to pick up that bystander. Oh, my wife's cooking dinner. I really need to get home. Let that bystander just... They can fix their own problems. This is a challenge. This is going on every day. You're going to walk out somewhere and you're going to do something and you're going to feel like God's telling you to do something. You're going to reason with them. Let's reason about this, Lord. No, no, no. What's the reason? I told you to do it. Amen. Your question is, are you going to step out and do it? Amen. Here's an example. I worked downtown. And I was only going to take uh, my credit card. I went there early in the morning to go get breakfast. Because uh, I know I was going to work a long day, so I was going to go down to get breakfast. And the Lord said, what are you doing? I'm taking my credit card to go downtown to get breakfast. And this is like around 7 o'clock in the morning. And he said, no, 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 no. Take your money clip, put money in it. I knew where this was going. Really, Lord? I really don't want to do that. I know what's going to happen. Take your money clip. So I took my money clip and I put it down in there. And... I'm walking down the street. Now it's 7 o'clock in the morning and usually downtown Lansing there's no one around but I have a guy across the street, a black guy, yelling at me. Hey dude! You! Yeah! You! Hey. It's like, oh Lord, no, this is not happening. <laughs> so I go walking over there and I said, yes, can I help you? And he says, I need a bus ticket. I said, okay, I can give you a buck 25. No, 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 no. I need 27 dollars. Okay, I don't know about you, but driving a bus over here in Lansing only costs about twenty-five. And the guy said, "Well, really, I just got out of prison. And I'm on parole, and I want to get to my family, and they live in Detroit." I, and the bus stops. I mean, the bus station is just around the corner. So him and I walked over there, and I asked to determine what the what it would cost one way ticket to get to um, to Detroit. That's where it was going. And it cost $27. And how much money did I have in my pocket? $27. So I paid a $27 ticket. And at that time, I said, I want you to remember this. I want you to find a Bible-believing church. I want you to find Jesus Christ. And I want you to go there and get to know Him. Because I'm not doing this for me. I'm doing this for the glory of God. Amen. I'm doing it because I want you to see God's love in me. I'm showing God's love in a practical way. That's why I'm doing it. And that's my hope. Now, I could have reasoned myself out, took only my just plastic card, and walked downtown and said, Fooey on that guy. Or not even go across the street, but I didn't. Because God was prompting me to do what I was supposed to do. Did it cost me 27 bucks? Yeah. But you can't put a price on a soul, as someone said. That's right. You can't put a price on a soul. And I don't know where that person is. may never see him again. But you know what? I know I did what God wanted. And that's where my joy came from. Amen. That's where my joy came from. So lack of faith. So there we go. If you sum it all up, when you talk about these seven verses, we had a communication breakdown. We had reasoning. We had pondering. Lack of faith. And a final disaster. And the final disaster, we all have to endure. It's sin. From that moment on, that lie came about, and she bought into it. And Adam as well, because he was right there with her. He, he ate it from it as well. When that, that happened, we have to endure. But it goes on today. We ponder, we reason. Who are we trusting? The only thing stopping you from having a relationship from God is you. Amen. Amen. There's no one else going to stop you. You can walk out here today and you can have a relationship in the parking lot, on the bus, at home, in the bathroom, wherever the case may be. Amen. You can have a relationship with Him. There's no one that can stop you from having a relationship with Him. Amen. Amen. No one. The only one stopping you is you. You can always come up with a lot of reasons why not to pick up the Bible and read it. And when you really think about this, in the Bible. Now, I tried to Google it and look. There's like over 700 promises. <laughs> and those are promises that are committed, that are kept. Why wouldn't you want to read the Bible with that many promises in store for you? I mean, really think about it. 
Would you, is there any other book on earth that can give you that many promises and be committed to it? I don't think anybody can do that. But only God can. The Bible has so many promises in it that are committed for you. That he wants for you to have. All you have to do is just give your life over and on to him. Open up your heart. He wants to dine with you. Let him in. Have a relationship with him. Talk with him. And you know, at times, even though when you don't realize it, that one set of footprints in the sand, that's what he's carrying. That's what he wants. In fact, the conversation is one way that the Holy Spirit is prompting you. He's tugging on your heart to let him in. You can reason and ponder all you want. But without Jesus, it's meaningless. Amen. I'll leave you these seven words in John 15. If you don't remember anything out of this whole sermon, I want you to remember these seven words. It's in John 15, 5. He says, Jesus says, Apart from me, you can do nothing. Amen. You want a fulfillment of life? You want joy? You want contentment? It's right there. All you have to do is invite him in. Invite him into your heart because he's tugging on it, he's knocking on it. And he'll reason with you and he'll give you the best. He'll ponder with you. He'll give you pondering that, wow God, it's amazing what you can do in this life. And what you can do through me and around me and how I can impact other lives. That's where our joy comes from. We need each other. We need each other. So, I close in prayer with this. Every head down, every head down, every eye closed. And if there's anyone here that has not accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior, please lift a hand. Just a quick hand. So I'm going to ask the next question. If there's anybody here that has a struggle in life that you need Jesus Christ to answer a prayer for you, lift your hand. Amen, 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 amen. Please pray with me. Just quietly, in your heart, have an open heart. Father, let us keep in mind that you are our creator. You created heaven and earth. You created us from the time. You gave us breath. And apart from you, we are truly nothing without your son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins. We ask you that you come into our hearts. You dine with us. You reason with us. You give us our needs and not what our wants are. And that we can trust in you and delight in you. That we come to love you more and know you more. That you walk with us, guide us, and protect us from ourselves. Correct us with your justice in short of your anger. Don't take our lives. Love us, O oh Lord, for we wish to love you. For we know we give you the thanks and the praise, for your love endures forever. For apart from your Son, Jesus Christ, we are nothing. Amen. In Jesus' name, to our Father, amen. 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 That's right. If there's any, here's the altar right here. If you have prayer needs or whatever the case may be, just now's the time to come up. Now's the time to just dump them right here. That's what he wants. He wants to hear from you. He wants to have a relationship with you. Please come. Let's stand and turn to page 191 and we'll sing the first two verses of We Have Heard the Joyful Sound.
Father, as we walk out here today, that we walk with you. And at, even at times you carry us. But let us be a bright, shining light in this dark community so people will come to know you in a personal way. Let us be your ambassadors. And at the same time, fill us with your spirit. Burn the impurities out of us so we shine even brighter. For once again, we give you the thanks and the praise for you are good, your love endures forever. In Jesus' precious name to our Father. Amen. Amen.